Okay, here come eight. They'll be here in just a minute. Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to today's Tuesday topic. We're still waiting for a few more folks to join us from the waiting room. But while they are coming in, let me go ahead and just remind you about our uh, upcoming Tuesday topics. Uh, next week on Tuesday, July 28, uh, we'll be having a conversation on coronavirus in minority groups in the United States, a panel discussion led by a PhD candidate for nutrition sciences, uh, Lisa Lanza. Um, and then on uh, Tuesday, August 4th, uh, a research skills session by our friends in CNHP Research Discovery and Innovation. Um, this is a research skills on an introduction, introduction to research match. Um, that should be an interesting discussion. Um, got a few more folks that are coming in. Here they come. And let's just wait for that last person to join us. Thank you so much to uh, Lindsay Edwards and to Lydia Sawyer for leading us through this conversation. And uh, Lindsay, you want to go ahead and get us started? Sure. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Lydia Vez Sawyer and I are presenting Being Anti-Racist. Um, this is our second workshop in which we've introduced the characteristics and antidotes of white supremacist culture. The first one we'll, you'll see in a slide later has an available link because it was recorded also. Um, I do want everyone to know that this is recorded. We will have a breakout session later that will not be recorded. Lydia Vez, so you want to kick off introductions? Sure. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Um, so my name is Lydia Vaz Sawyer, um, as my colleague just mentioned, um, and I'm a director of Community Health Wellness and Strategic Partnerships from Stephen and Sandra Schaller, 11th Street Family Health Services of Drexel University. Um, so we are affiliated um, with Family Practice and Counseling Network, and we are also um, Drexel University College of Nursing and Health Professions. And we're both happy to be here to represent both 11th Street um, and Drexel as well. And just to locate 11th Street, that's our, our short name for the Stephen and Sandra Scheller. We are in the Richard Allen neighborhood in Philadelphia, PA. Um, and I am a board certified dance women therapist and a licensed professional counselor and manage the creative arts therapies department at 11th Street. So for today's agenda, um, we're going to be discussing an overview of white supremacist culture. Uh, secondly, health effects of white supremacist, the effects of white supremacist culture, um, and also the white supremacist culture characteristics and antidotes. So as my colleague mentioned during series one, we went through uh, the first half and we were able to go through examples and antidotes. Um, and while we're going to mention them during this session, just to kind of give everyone a refresher, we're going to be digging deeper into the second half of those white supremacist cultures. A lot of what we're going to be doing today um, in terms of examples and anecdotes and conversation is closely linked to healthcare professionals as well as higher education. And I would mention to be transparent, you know, our agenda is to help, help everyone understand that white supremacy has been the epidemic um, since 1492. And, and we're interested in helping you learn how to shift white supremacist culture and, and commit yourself to change. Uh, so, you know, part of um, anti or anti racist work is being anti oppressive as well. During our first workshop, I read the diversity welcome created by the process work Institute and the link is there. Um, but I, I want to, so I want to mention inclusivity for certain groups today, but I want to underscore that, you know, why it's important to do that. Um, in, in white supremacist culture, it, it was intentionally designed to be exclusionary and, and difference is often seen as bad and threatening. So in anti-racist work, we aim to be less oppressive 
to those who are naturally beautiful and different um, because what we've decided is normal is white, heterosexual, able-bodied, middle, upper class, traditionally educated. So we're trying to get away from that. So today, I wanna let you all know that we welcome all races and ethnicities, all of those who identify on the spectrum of LGBTQIA, people with different faiths, religious traditions, and those who don't belong to, to the tradition, people with disabilities, visible and invisible, all ages, our ancestors, and those indigenous to this land in Philadelphia, which is the Lenape. So um, just an overview of white supremacist culture. You know, it, it is the, the waters that we all swim in. And the longer you swim in a culture, the more invisible it becomes. So if we look at the graph or the, um, the picture in the top right hand corner, you know, why does one white man carry so much weight? Why is the scale so tipped? Um, that is the nature, you know, of white supremacist culture. So by culture is a constructed knowledge shared by a group of people, which means it can be deconstructed, right? And recreated and rebuilt, which is what we're interested in. White supremacy culture is, is a political, economic, social system of domination, essentially saying white is better than black and brown, et cetera. I wanted to point out, I didn't mention that we will be using the acronym BIPOC, black, indigenous, people of color. You might also hear Lydia Vez and I say black and brown. Um, and sometimes I just say black because white supremacist culture was intentionally designed as anti-blackness. So, um, so, you know, part of the thinking with white supremacist culture, some thoughts that might uh, match white supremacy are that we give um, permission to treat black and brown people lesser than or to blame by 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 BIPOC people more quickly. We validate and advantage white people. So this is the scale. If we're validating one group, then then the other is oppressed. Um, we consider white people to be benevolent within white supremacy culture is racism and colorism. So light skinned people are superior to dark skinned people. This is part of that thinking. Um, so within white supremacy culture, you know, it's an artificial historically constructed thing to protect white wealth is, is part of that history. Um, it continues this, this inherited slave ideology of perpetuating self-hatred and devaluation. Um, it can be subtle and nuanced, but it is pervasive. So if we are all swimming in white supremacist culture, if it's unavoidable, which it is, then white people um, are all enacting racism, right? Or we are all susceptible to being racist. And, and there's a big R and a little R racist and everything in between. So this graphic on the left talks about overt white supremacy and then, and then the covert white supremacy, which you know, you'll see in quotation says, or in a parenthesis, socially acceptable. But, but even if it's tolerated socially, it does not mean that it's not creating harm. So uh, we really want to understand all of the little R's, you know, which is probably where most of us are in this. I also want to point out on the right hand side that we have intrapersonal, that's internalized racism, how we're embodying the inequities, and then we have interpersonal level. This is where most of us think that being racist lives, but I want, you know, clearly you can see it's institutional, community, systemic. That's why we're pr presenting within an academic setting, right? Because academia is institutional level and that affects interpersonal and inter interpersonal, also affects community and systemic. Take it, Lydia Vaz. Why challenge white supremacist culture, which is a question most people ask, why should I care? Why does this matter? Um, and the description we see on the left hand side is basically, in a nutshell, white is not better, it's normed. 
Um, so culture is so powerfully precisely because it's so present at the same time. So very difficult to name or identify. So we're living in it just like um, my colleague Lindsay mentioned, but it becomes so pervasive and so normalized that we don't even see the, how insidious it can be um, and how damaging it can be both to um, black race individuals as well as white race individuals. Um, and we'll go through that later on during the presentation. So the characteristics of white supremacy are damaging because they're used as norms, as I illustrated, um, standards without being proactively named or chosen by the group. They're blindly, they're overt. They pro promote white supremacist thinking um, on different scopes, as you saw in the previous um, slide. There were different levels to racism. Um, so we see them throughout and we all participate in it. Um, they are damaging to both people of color and white people. Um, so white supremacist culture leads to colorism. Um, and I, just to kind of distinguish colorism with racism, colorism really, it, it, it happens between um, individuals in the black race. Um, and that's when you start seeing or noticing or hearing the notion of the lighter, the better, brown skin, light skin, and so forth. And you experience racism in those realms as well. Organizations that are people of color led or majority people of color can also demonstrate many damaging characteristics of white supremacist culture. So white supremacist culture are designed to be anti-black. Um, and again, we see how these, how it's sculpted and normalized systemically in organizations, but then how we are, are part of that process as well uh, without even realizing that we are. And I say we, again, I speak about black race individuals and white race individuals, but this in particular is really looking at um, how white race individuals can be a, play a part of it without even knowing that they're being a part of the process. Mm -hmm. So another important point here, um, and I'm gonna read this verbatimly because it's, it's bolded. We will never um, end racism without uprooting white supremacy. Naming the real problem is the first step. So the acknowledgement um, that we are living in white supremacist culture, um, that it's participated. How are you, the question is, how are you playing a role in white supremacist culture? Through your actions, um, through the systems that you live on a daily basis, um, looking at policies, looking at how things are structured, and then how you by default, by being um, swimming in these waters, are then enacting and being an active participant in that process. So there are better ways to live and think. Um, white supremacist culture suppresses the brilliance of other cultures. Um, and I'm... I think you hit it. Yes. I have people's faces in the bottom, so I'm trying to see the entire slide. <laughs> um, but that, that was it in a nutshell. Um, I want to let Darren and Lydia Vez know, I cannot see the chat. I don't know if it's because I'm sharing the screen, um, but if there's anything emerging, then I will trust you two to name that. There have been no messages in the chat just yet, but if anybody has anything that they have a question or they want to acknowledge, just pop it into the chat and we'll all let uh, Lidivez and Lindsay know. Thank you, Darren. I just I just uh, populated the chat. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so this is um, this slide is you know an entire presentation in of itself, um, but I wanted to just link racism to health because it's undoubtedly you know the health effects of upholding white supremacist culture are undoubtedly researched and. Um, and so, I mean, you can see here, racism, not race, causes health disparities. White supremacy and racism on the structural, institutional, cultural, on all of the systems level um, affect these domains. And so the power imbalance and the wealth imbalance, you know, within those. And then, and then those affect, affect social influencers of health. Um, and the way, you know, whether you're oppressed or privileged, depending on, you know, the, your, the color of how people are treating you based on the color of your skin is, is what lends to the disparity in health. So there are some citations on here. This is, um, I'm not going to spend much more time on it, but I just want to be clear that this is well researched, that racism is trauma and it has major health effects for us. So um, if we get, you know, so 
if we think about, okay, how do we, how do we reduce it? How do we start to shift? One of the perspectives is to really um, be mindful of, of our bodies when we are feeling and enacting and I mean every day because we're swimming in it. So part of, you know, Resma Minicum and his book, My Grandmother's Hands, um, has been a, a strong um, resource for me in understanding my own racism and how how my body responds. So, you know, his quotation, the real battlefield is inside our bodies. If we are to survive as a country, it is inside our bodies where this conflict will need to be resolved. Um, so, for, so we have different responsibilities, white bodied responsibility and then ways for BIPOC to heal. So I, I will talk um, to the white bodied responsibility so, you know, a lot of um, harm comes from our behavior, you know, our violent behavior that is enacted because of our emotional responses. So part of our work is to calm our emotional responses. Um, part of it is to understand why the emotion is arising. Why am I fearful in this moment? And a lot of that is by identifying our biases. Um, but if we don't react with a microaggression or by calling the police or by um, physically yelling at someone, right? We have the potential to whew, calm our nervous system and not harm a black person. Um, so let's see. Oh, oh, so, you know, in our history, in our, in our history of, of um, slavery and racism, we as white people have numbed ourselves to feeling the rage and the fear and the disgust because it's a disaffinity. It doesn't make sense to us. Um, and that is, you know, you can read about that in depth in Resma Minicum's book. But so we have to unnumb ourselves and we have to be disgusted and we have to be enraged um, so that we don't keep tolerating it. Um, I see a lot of typos on that third box. That, that's my bad. Sorry about that. Uh, I do want to highlight because I find that when I am when I am enacting my my racism and my white supremacy, I am at my most immature state. Um, so I, I want to say that one of the charges is to remove whiteness from supremacy. Whiteness in itself isn't bad, but it's bad when it's only linked to supremacy, and that's our understanding of it. So, you know, Resma Minicum calls us to, to redefine whiteness as caring, open, and grown up instead of how it currently resides as childish, selfish, and closed-minded. You know, when I react in defensiveness, I'm a, I'm a professional counselor. Like, I know that that's not the healthiest emotional way of being. Um, so that's, that's me being more emotionally immature. So he says, grow up, start caring for our fellow human beings and earn the respect that we crave. Thank you, Lindsay. And, and I'm gonna speak about um, the effects or what we can, number one, the effects of, of trauma in, in the black body, um, but most importantly, what we can do to heal um, our black bodies. And Lindsay, I appreciate the examples that you illustrated because um, those are kind of the insidious acts that are coming from, from whiteness and it's landing on a black body. When we receive it um, as black race individuals, it's trauma. And we're gonna go over this in the next couple of slides, but it's, it's the microaggressions, it's trauma, um, all these feelings that are going through our bodies, whether we are conscious of it or not, is trauma. Um, so, Healing from white supremacy based on literature really states that um, black and brown individuals need to have an understanding of black and native history, including about uh, uh, abolition efforts, colonization, systemic racism, being aware of personal racialization processes, um, and tapping into creativity and hope. Um, and I think important in that factor is um, Again, we all have the work to do, but what is the specific work that black race individuals have to do in this process in order to heal, which is extremely important. Um, and we have listed a few of them here, which is really looking for um, the acknowledgement of anti-blackness, um, being wrong and genuinely apologizing, 
unlearning anti-blackness, what does that look like? Um, if we have been molded to do exactly what we're doing, um, an example that's illustrated in, in this uh, slide is the notion of protecting white whiteness, protecting white people in general. Um, and how are we then placing ourselves in a position to actually heal as well? Um, so finding affinity groups, um, and that could be, you can heal through the process of singing, of, of, of um, rhythmic group, clapping, um, being able to, to illustrate acts that really are genuine to your culture, but also being able to illustrate them together. Um, and that's why affinity groups are so pivotal and so important in, the, in this context, because you are healing, you having a sense of relativity to people who are experiencing what you're experiencing, um, and they become extremely important to heal. Um, and also learning to soothe and anchor yourself rather than expecting or demanding others um, to soothe you. I want to be clear that the white bodied list is not at all exhaustive. I started at the body level because that's oftentimes our first barrier. But certainly we should be learning our history. Certainly we should be in white affinity groups to break down and dismantle our biases. Um, you know, I mean, it is, yeah, there's so much, there's so much work, but this is a starting point. Okay, so, so we are gonna review um, the characteristics and anecdotes that Kenneth Jones and Tima Okun put out, um, published for us. In our first one, we, we covered the ones that are not bolded, perfectionism through right to comfort. So we won't talk about those today. Um, I wanna you know, just say that this list, it often describes the invisible ways that we're socializing. So if, you know, in this blue box, if we want to create a more equitable world, we have to interrogate these. We have to understand them rather than just accept them because they're, they're harmful. Um, and then, you know, on this, the disrupting culture is essentially a graphic of the antidote, right? This is, this is the culture that we're wanting um, to go toward. And you'll see the YouTube link on the bottom of this slide is the previous presentation that workshop one that Lydia Vez and I did. So one of the characteristics um, we want to explain is sense of urgency. So what is sense of urgency? Um, and there's an illustration of, of a person, a provider putting a Band-Aid um, on a patient. So it really is time is rushed, making it difficult to take time to be inclusive encourage democratic and our thoughtful decision making to think long term or consider consequences. So in a nutshell, the idea that something has to be done, and I'm going to immediately check that box without considering all the processes that has to go along to actually make it sustainable, to make sure that it's long term and that we're not revisiting the issue again. Um, but if we are we know exactly what to do in a very democratic collective process to be able to not only be inclusive, but to make sure that our, our processes are well vetted. So an example would be um, um, evident during our current climate, anti-racism efforts. Um, for most of you um, who have been tuning in to the very robust media um, messages we've been getting, everyone is checking that box. Um, and while for some people, we want to believe and we have the hope that it will be a sustainable effort um, for another group. It may be just checking that box, unfortunately, right? That sense of urgency. Um, while vital, moving too quickly in order to check a box without allowing democratic process. Um, so again, it results in unsustainable efforts, um, performative actions versus genuine collaboration, more reactive versus proactive. Um, without salient voices being present. Who's sitting around the table when you're making these decisions? Um, who are the voices? Um, are, are you letting these voices be heard? And are you really able to implement these voices um, in ways that are going to be inclusive? Um, so the antidote to that process would be involving long-term planning, inclusivity, as I mentioned before, diversity. Most importantly, integrating people who didn't get a chance to speak, who didn't get a chance to, to let their voices be heard. Those people who are actually enduring the experience 
Um, for admin, um, an example would be train leaders to expect that culture takes longer to change than anyone expects. So yes, we want to be able to have a quick fix. We want to be able to put a Band-Aid and stop the bleed. Um, but at the same time, we also have to understand that while the bleeding stops, the, the healing has to also happen. Um, and the wound is still there if we don't take care of it the way we should. Um, and in a medical setting, be clear about how you will make good decisions in an atmosphere of urgency. Yeah, and I want to point out again that these characteristics were at, at one point intentionally designed to be exclusive. Most of us now carry them out as normed culture without understanding what we're doing. Um, so while a sense of urgency, especially in a medical setting, is sometimes needed, we do not want it to be the default. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's all of the, none of these are, are bad altogether, right? It's about, we don't want them to be the only option. Um, so in a medical setting specifically, you know, if, if you have protocol that um, are built for crisis situations, we want to make sure that the protocol was designed in a democratic way. Okay, so moving to quantity over quality. Um, so, you know, this is essentially um, so many parts to it that we're we're valuing product over relationship. We're we're valuing the end goal, no matter what happens in the middle. Um, I want to highlight this example of this Kenyan athlete who became confused right before the finish line. Um, so, he, so the Kenyan athlete was leading and, and, and then he, he couldn't understand where the finish line was. He became confused. So the Spanish athlete behind him essentially paused his running and ushered, shepherded his body um, toward the finish line. And so a journalist asked the Spanish runner, why did you do that? Why did you let the Kenyan win? And he replied, I, I didn't let him win. He was going to win. Um, the Spanish runner said, but what would be the merit of my victory? What would be the honor of the medal, right? What would my mom think of that? Um, so, you know, it was, he already knew he was, he was the winner. Um, it would have been cheating and taking advantage of. So um, a lot of this comes into play with, with grant, with funders who want evidence-based practices or measurable outcomes instead of trusting the lived experience or personal testimony. Um, you know, we hear, well, we want, we want proof that racism has negatively affected your health. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, and, and the antidotes. And include process or quality goals in your planning. Um, so for example, if you have a goal of inclusivity, think about how that can be measured. Um, so we're not saying that measurement is not important, but we want, um, we want to look for ways to measure the process and not the product, not just the product. Um, and then, you know, especially, so here's what happens in meetings sometimes. We, we start to ignore the group dynamics that are happening because it's very uncomfortable. And with, with quantity over quality, we want to like ignore those emotions and push through. So we might plow through a meeting agenda despite the grumbles that are happening. So the antidote to that is, is recognize those times when you need to pause the agenda well, the set agenda, because now this has become the agenda, right? Now the immediacy of tending to the quality of our relationships has, has now become prioritized. So we want to address people's underlying concerns in the moment. I'm, so, I'm just waiting for nods to see if that makes sense. And I, I can't get it. All right, here we go. That was perfect, Lindsay. Thank you. Yeah. And I think this is a great um, segue into worship of the written word, um, only one way. 
and I can't see it, but I know um, many of you can see the arrows um, that my colleague added to the slide, because it really speaks to the notion that it's either one way or, or not, right? Um, so this particular, actually the arrows are not here. They this, aren't here. I realized that too, Luba. <laughs> <laughs> so this particular slide um, really speaks to the notion um, of writing literacy, writing and literacy were offered to, to white people originally. So description, um, I'll read the description. So the rule became it can be written or read um, or it didn't happen. So it was very similar to that, that idea of accountability um, that most of us uh, utilize without even thinking where it came from. Um, or, or what, is, what is his history? What is his roots? If it's, if it's not written, it didn't happen. If it's not in the memo, it didn't happen. Um, so doesn't shuffle the experience, very similar to the previous, uh, the previous um, description that we defined. Um, so grant organizations wanting evidence-based modalities um, and value other ways in which information gets shared, such as email. So you have to see it, it has to be very objective. It has to be um, evidenced. It has to be something that we can prove happened. Um, and strong documentation and writing skills are more highly valued than someone's experience. Um, and, and that can be contextualized in many different spaces. So an example really is um, a few examples leaning into different audiences, um, don't value intergenerational storytelling, um, screening race through resumes and cover letters, um, literacy is white supremacist culture. And going back to that example, the idea is um, if you are, let's say for instance, going through different resumes, um, cover letters, um, being the chair of a department, you're trying to hire a qualified candidate, the most qualified candidate will be the one that is able to present the best on paper. That person that is able to have all the punctuations and everything aligned, um, rather than the person, the human that you're bringing to the table. And again, the, we, we all have been, vict uh, we all have been witness to it, right? Um, and have also applied those different types of norms, but that's that, that's that's the question. That that's that's the problem. That is, it has become normalized, um, and it's behaviors that are really rooted into this white supremacist culture. So another example is a student experiences a form of racism and addresses a problem with a faculty member, rather than the, that talking to the student's experiences as legitimate act of racism. Again, thinking about the experience and thinking about the effects of racism on the body. Um, the faculty doubts her and asks, um, and asks her for evidence that proves legitimacy. How do we really know it was racism? It could have been something else. Um, so an antidote to help this particular characteristics or undo this characteristics will be accept that there are many ways to get to the same goal. Um, once the group has made a decision about which way will be taken, honor that decision and see what you have learned. Um, see what you and the organization will learn from taking, go, taking that away from, from the actual um, experience. Rather than dismissing the story as in the story of the actual faculty and student, the faculty can take the time to study how people inside and outside the organization may be experiencing racism, um, even though that faculty member did not experience it herself. Um, trust your student's account and help her document in university standardized reporting. Um, so again, this can be contextualized in many different spaces, um, but it's really looking at that we have to value the experience, um, even if it's not legitimate in writing, um, that is not just one way or the other. Yeah, and, and the helping document in the university standardized reporting, um, you know, think about first generation college attendees. Uh, you know, they, they might not at all be acculturated to the, the protocol in a university system. One, one client who was a first generation college goer told me that um, she was told that the professor had office hours. And her understanding was that that's when that professor was in their office working by themselves. Not that she could go access the professor then. Um, so, you know, a lot that's protocoled that we understand has been normed, you know, within the white supremacist culture. Uh, another example quickly is that, you know, at 11th Street, we say, don't just send out an email, 
Like that, that's, there's not only one way to communicate. There are many ways that people habituate to communication. And as leaders, we have to make sure that we're making communication as, access, as accessible in as many forms as possible. Uh, so paternalism is the next characteristic. Um, so, you know, so part of paternalism is making decisions that are poised as for the greater good, but they actually benefit a hidden agenda. This may be very nuanced. Um, you know, if you look at the first example, the physician withholding relevant information about a terminal illness of a patient to protect them from psychological stress, right? Who says it's the, the um, physician's right to withhold information and who also says that they could protect them from psychological stress. Um, oftentimes paternalism, or all of the time, paternalism is, is depriving the marginalized constituents, you know, whoever the constituent of the decision is, is, is depriving their choice and voice in the matter. So we're, we're making a decision for the welfare of a group of people without being inclus inclusionary, right? Without including them in the decision. Mm -hmm. um, so part of this is those without power understand that they do not have it and they understand who does. You ask anyone in an organization who has power and they'll, they'll probably know. Um, those without power do not really know how decisions get made and who makes what decisions. And yet they are completely clear about the impact of the decisions that were made for them. So, um, you know, without uh, the other example of withholding access to a generic pharmaceutical drug because it's not approved, um, but it may be approved and made for our health, but it may not stand to offer as much profit. Um, you know, I have Lincoln's, uh, the, the Emancipation Memorial statue. If you look that up and paternalism, you'll get um, some really interesting articles. You know, there it's being proposed to be removed. Um, and, you know, one of the, I mean, there's so many, this could just stand as the symbol of white supremacist culture because there are so many things to dissect about that image and this, the, the creation of this. But an example of paternalism is that it, de it depicts Lincoln as the hero, um, you know, as the sole emancipator, when we know that there were lots of black men uh, involved in, abolition, in the abolitionist movement for emancipation. So it depicts Lincoln as a hero at the ex expense of black people. And that's, you know, we could go into how black people are being depicted in that image. Um, so an antidote, the antidote. Consider clients or, or you know, client autonomy and rights over trying to protect them. Um, ensure that everyone knows and understands who makes what decisions in the organization. If you try and do that, you might uncover a lot of covert power that's been dispersed um, and, and reconsider your org chart. Ensure everyone knows and understands their level of responsibility and authority in the organization and include people who are affected by decisions in the decision making process. Oh, here's our, here are our arrows, Lydia Vez. We, we put them in either or. <laughs> Which does bring me, before you start this one, it just, it, all of these intersect. It's kind of hard to talk about one without referencing the other characteristic. We do, it's an intersectionality that's very fluid. We find ourselves enacting many of them simultaneously. Thank you for, for that preamble, Lindsay. Um, <laughs> they sound similar too, um, but they, they are, very much um, interlinked with one another, interwoven with one another. Um, so either or thinking, there goes my arrows, um, is either my way or not. <laughs> it's either right or wrong, good or bad. There's no in between, there's no gray area. Um, and this beautiful image you see in the bottom that my colleague added to the slide really depicts what we're trying to say in the slide, right? Um, so the whole idea that there's black and white. Well, if I eliminated black and white, then there has to be in gray area, but that's not really the case. There's a whole spectrum of colors because there's so much going on. It's so dense, it's so complex um, that we can't put it in a box. 
and that's okay, um, which really leans to perfectionism, right? Um, so making it difficult to learn from mistakes or accommodate conflict, um, resulting in trying to simplify complex things. We're complex individuals. Um, you know, we're a complex society. It's so difficult to actually put something in a box. Um, so for example, believing that poverty is simply resulting from a lack of education. Um, so other examples um, that we may have illustrated earlier um, is you either take your medicine or you don't. It's something that tends to be um, very prevalent in, in the medical um, centers and medical field in general for people who don't really understand how white supremacist culture may actually um, lean itself towards the work in the profession and how it's normalized. Um, so it's as simple as that. Um, either you're working or you're not, you're lazy. Um, you're either racist or you're not. Um, so creating an opportunity to discuss racism experienced by a student, you either didn't show up or you did, instead of considering how the format of discussion may have between threatening or not natural for um, non-white supremacist cultures. So another example I have that um, I think I have the time to briefly share, um, for those of you who are familiar, West Philadelphia, um, the Bartram Gardens, beautiful garden, um, but right beside it, you do see that they are, they have um, the Bartram's Village, which is a home development. Um, and when it was first created, the idea of this rehabilitation zone um, was to have individuals that worked at the actual garden to work um, that lived in the in, in the home to actually work in the garden. It was considered re restorative and rehabilitative. Um, however, as time has gone by, um, stats have shown that a lot of individuals who work at the garden do not live right across the street at the actual um, homes. So it has, it's like two different worlds, but they're right across from each other. Um, so someone with this thinking would actually say, well, we actually opened up the opportunity for individuals who, work, who actually live in these homes to work here, but they just didn't show up. They, they're just not there. They're just, they don't participate. They're, they're not present in this, in this space, um, rather than why they're not present. Why do they feel that they don't belong in this space? Why are they not being able to benefit from the garden and what it has to offer when individuals from so many different places come to this garden? Um, so it's really the idea of, of just, again, very black and white. So antidotes um, would be both, um, really thinking about both and and, looking at the in-between process, um, critical to manage polarities. Um, you can be both a racist and be working towards anti-racism. <laughs> <laughs> that is very much possible. Um, notice when people use either or language and push to come up with more than two alternatives. Replace either or with both an and. And, uh, you know, I would say a lot of my colleagues, um, and I know that Lindsay knows who I'm talking about, they specifically explicitly use the language both and. Um, because you, th that is possible. It's very much possible. Um, and it's really going anti the norm. Notice when people are simplifying complex issues, particularly when the stakes seem high or urgent, as we know, as we stated before, the sense of urgency um, is either this way or that way, um, needs to be made, slow down and encourage people to be, have a deeper analysis of the complexities. Um, and when people are faced with an urgent decision, take a break um, and, and really, I can't see what else it says on the end of the slide, um, take a break and give people some breathing room to be creative. Because again, we are all individuals um, and we have different types of aspects and perspectives we can bring to the table. Great, thank you, Lydia Bells. Yeah, when we're outside of the either or thinking, um, well, or, or when we're inside the either or thinking, we, we, oh no, okay, let me go. If we're outside of it, it we, can be, we can become ambivalent and that can be uncomfortable sometimes. And one of the characteristics from last session is, is the right to comfort um, that, that, you know, white supremacist culture upholds for white people. So it goes back to the body. We gotta get better at holding discomfort. Okay, so um, we are going to talk about power hoarding as one of the, uh, as the last identified characteristic. Um, but 
we're going to do a breakout session with that one. So I wanted to just point out quickly that I, you know, I've observed two other characteristics and I can't imagine how many more there are. So I just want to name the, cause I don't see these points falling into the other characteristics. Um, so assumptions and generaliz generalizations, I hear specifically a lot, well, really people practicing um, racism and colorism there's just a lot of assumptions and generalizations. And I think that that is happening because of the nature of segregation. So an antidote is really to, to integrate and ask people questions, really understand personal testimony so that you can't, you can't live in the world of assumption. Um, but you know, sometimes that means you were wrong and that does not go with the characteristics of, of perfectionism with white supremacy culture, right? And then winning versus resolving this, I was also kind of playing around with debating versus discussing. You know, I imagine like, what if we had the model of presidential candidates talking together in a circle, looking to resolve and progressive, <laughs> progress issues. Thank you for that facial, um, uh, movement, Darren, I appreciate that. So, um, yeah, I mean, we just have a culture of debating. So when we get into these discussions about racism, the goal is to win, right? Or police officers, like, is their goal to win the interaction or is it to resolve it and understand what's happening? Um, so sometimes our fragility keeps us, like, makes us too vulnerable to be wrong, so we just have to win. Okay, so power hoarding, oh, I feel like we're moving right along. Um, so it's pretty clear. I mean, you know, this doesn't have to be described too much, but it, it is worth bringing to our awareness um, that it's a characteristic. So it's really not sharing the power. It's those people who are in power feeling threatened if suggestions for change are made. Um, so, you know, include power sharing in your organization's value statement. Um, discuss what good leadership looks like and make sure people understand that a good leader develops the power and skills, um, you know, helps other people develop the skills of power sharing. Um, understand that change is inevitable and, and that someone challenging your leadership and the equity of power is healthy and productive. Um, I wanna point out in the description that those with power don't see themselves as hoarding the power and they don't feel threatened. But those without power sometimes feel like they have none or they don't know how to get through to the people who do have power. And then those with power assume they have the best interests of the organization at heart. So again, this is kind of that like white benevolence. Um, and they assume those wanting change are, well, that's not benevolent, benevolent. So they assume those wanting changes are ill-informed. So, oh, they must not know what they're talking about. They must not know our system. Uh, you know, it's, it's dismissive when someone is addressing um, a change. So, um, so we've given you examples of every characteristic except for power hoarding. Um, as an opportunity to internalize and reflect, do some self-reflection, we're going to do breakout sessions. Um, Darren, how many people do we have? We can't hear you, you're muted. Um, well, well, there Darren, we go. Yeah. Now you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not muted anymore. <laughs> um, uh, we've got um, 32 counting the three of us. So okay. it'll be between five and six people per room. Great. Okay. So if you're um, a BIPOC member in the breakout room, room, if you can identify a time when you suggested a change and it was immediately denied or, or not immediately necessarily, but it was denied because someone's power was threatened, 
Um, and for Y participants, if you can identify a time you used your power position because you felt threatened by a suggested change. Um, so we're going to do that. We're going to come back together. We'll briefly, the, you know, the next thing is just um, reflection and um, questions. So these, this will be for five minutes. It's like a speed dating, power hoarding exercise. Okay. There's no sense of urgency though, right? Of course there is. All right. All right, so I'm going to open up the rooms. Um, and uh, just so you all know, um, I'm going to pause the recording here. Uh, anything that we've done from here since the beginning to now has been recorded. The things in your the conversations in the break room are not going to be recorded. And then we'll start the recording back up when everybody comes back to us. All right. Thank you. No problem. Everyone should be able to join their rooms. Hello everyone and welcome back. I think everybody's microphones should be active again. Do we have everybody back? Lindsay, you're muted. Hey, sorry everyone, welcome back. I'm, I've lost my ability to share. Let me just go back to our, let me see if I can go back to this. Um, slide here. Okay. So we're just um, returning and interested in questions, um, uh, reflections from that experience, and then also questions um, that you have from the whole presentation. And I'm going to scroll through. So anyone who missed, you can take a walk with us through the PowerPoint. So feel free to unmute yourself um, or to offer questions in the chat that Liddy Vez and I can address. Is Liddy back? Um, I'm here. <laughs> okay, I can't see you anymore. So we're curious to know your impressions, um, conversations that occurred during the breakout session. Anyone can kind of jump in if you don't feel comfortable talking. Um, we're happy to read what you write in the chat as well. Oh, I see a chat. Oh, let's see. Okay. One of the members in my group um, was talking about the empowerment of understanding the body level connection. And if nothing else, we can start with really understanding what's happening internally and um, learning tools to gain more self-control of our emotional reactions. Anyone else? Um, one of my mentors in this work, Dr. Roberta Waite, who I believe is on the call now, always says participation, not perfection. So feel free to participate, um, even if it doesn't come out perfectly, or is there a perfect, right? And I can tell you, I'm purposely being quiet. <laughs> <laughs> that is Dr. Roberta Waite. <laughs> so I have a question, um, and didn't get to ask this in my group because we ran out of time, but um, to 
women shared experiences. One talked about how she, she sometimes gets followed around in stores. And uh, one person shared that she was told to go back to her country um, by a group of white women at a concert. And my first reaction, like as an empath, is to apologize. I'm sorry that that happened to you. Um, and I'm just wondering if that is part of my like guilt over this, or is that an appropriate reaction? I don't know if that's, I, I don't know if anybody has thoughts on that. Does anyone have a reaction to that, especially um, a black or brown person? I mean, honestly, I'm the one who shared the one um, of the concert of like these white girls behind me. Um, sorry, sorry, my video camera's not on, it's not working, but um, I'm from Honduras. I'm, you know, dark. I'm not like, I'm like dark, I'm brown. But um, yeah, they were yelling, like, go back to your country when they saw me like sit like next to my friends who were, they're Latin American, but they're white. Um, and I would like, in terms of your, question Bridget I don't find that like offensive if somebody tells me that but I don't know some people read into things a little bit more so I if, like if you told me that like I'm sorry for what you went through like for me it's not like I would be like well thank you for taking into consideration my feelings but like um yeah I, I mean that's all I wanted to say really thank you Bridget, sometimes um, I can get caught in beyond the acknowledgement. I can want to slip into white saviorism or trying to fix it or trying to get defensive for them, um, which I think is about, you know, managing a little bit of my discomfort. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just worth us always paying attention. Are we empathetically acknowledging and then are we trying to move beyond that? We have, we have come up to five, five o'clock. Liddy Vez, are we comfortable closing despite I feel like this could be a whole nother, we could continue for two more hours on reflection. We definitely can. And I, and I wanna, um, I, I wanna thank Lisa, who's also um, a colleague and, and a board member for sharing um, her experience. Um, I really appreciate that. Mm. And uh, yeah. Make it a part of the active conversation, the experiences that we actually encounter. You're welcome. Thank you for having this. This was, I liked it. <laughs> Thank you. One of our goals within CNHP is to be able to create structures in which we can have these dialogues. So this is part of our charge is to be able to, um, to do that, to scaffold and, and create them. We are, this is a workshop series for us. So we are picking out our next date. Um, our next workshop will likely be on the costs of oppression to white people and black and brown people um, in upholding white supremacy culture. And I did wanna add, just being mindful of time, um, that while this session was for an hour um, and it, it did offer robust information that this is really just an introductory session um, that this information, again, we, as Lindsay, my colleague mentioned, we can speak about it for days uh, on end, if not weeks or months. But this was really a session to introduce these characteristics um, with the hope that we can all move forward and do the work and continue to unpack what this means because it is an evolving process and it is a journey um, as well. Thank you, Lily Buzz. Mm -hmm. So Darren, you would probably motivate us to complete the questionnaires, um, which when we're trying to dismantle systemic racism, it is really important that we participate in speaking up about how this um, was helpful or hindering toward us. So we would really love your feedback. What's the format that people will get questionnaires, Darren? Um, I'm gonna send an email to everybody who uh, registered for the event. Um, if you don't get uh, the survey, send an email to tuesdaytopics at drexel.edu and I'll make sure you get it. Um, in, included in there is a little reminder about what today's event was 
um, and just click the link to fill out the survey. Should take you just five minutes. Um, doesn't take a lot of time, but it really gives us some really valuable information about how we can make these better for you going forward. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, See, thank you. Gonna, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to click back. Here are our email addresses if you need them, Lidivez and mine. Thanks, everyone. Take good care of yourselves. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining.